They say it's to protect you While they try to dispossess you Of the right to decide between wrong or right To openly discuss what politicians hide They want to keep their secret plans from the public eye We gotta keep our fires burning, keep our spirits bright We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people Money got no children And bombs ain't for building Killing ain't no way to make a peaceful day As all of God's children can easily explain We gotta keep our fires burning, keep our spirits bright Stand up and speak for what we know is right We gotta rise up, rise up, rise up Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people against the war Rise up people I see days ahead Kiss my children into bed All across the planet I see that everything is fine Rise up people Against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people against the war, rise up people. We got the power and the will and we'll do it for our children. Put the warmongers and the corporate whores in the history books with the dinosaurs. I claim my power, I claim my rights, and no dirty tricks are gonna change my mind. I'm gonna Rise up, rise up, rise up. I'm gonna rise up, rise up, rise up. Rise up, people against the war. 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 Rise up. This is uh, Dan Shea with uh, Veterans for Peace Forum. I want to welcome you back. Uh, we have a couple of guests here today, uh, Benjamin Martin uh, and uh, Ryan Wiley. One of the things that I wanted to um, first start off with is uh, I'm getting a little feedback here, guys, just in case you, you know that. Um, but I wanted to uh, raise the issue here that, you know, we can pick up the paper any day, and we can still see that in Iraq uh, a bomb killed four, at least 14 and we're talking about serious, continuous uh, <clears throat> battles are going on. The wars are supposed to be over, and we're supposed to be bringing the truce back. And even long after the wars have ended, I went a Vietnam veteran, and I would consider it friendly fire that, you know, I was an uh, Agent Orange victim, and I'm meeting uh, the third, fourth generation of children that are suffering from those effects that war left on the populations, both in this country and uh, <clears throat> around the world. Uh, there are veterans now facing um, uh, depleted uranium and uh, uh, burn pit exposure on chemicals that they breathe in while uh, occupied in another country. Yet, too often these veterans come back and uh, um, they don't know how to transition into civilian life and uh, they don't find what they're looking for at the VA. Um, they need sometimes physical and uh, uh, emotional support, uh, their families don't understand them, and so there are a number of organizations that have popped up to try and fill that need in between. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the one of the groups that I was just at uh, a showing of a movie called uh, uh, The Welcome uh, last Thursday at the First Unitarian Church, um, and it was for a benefit for the Northwest returning veterans. 
uh, project, which is a number of volunteers throughout the, <clears throat> the city who, if they're uh, therapists, offer their therapy to free to veterans, returning veterans and their family. Uh, they uh, have acupuncturists, massage, um, many, many different uh, uh, people totally volunteering their time to uh, address the needs of a, of a particular vet that requests it. And, uh, but that's not the end of it. And when we start talking, I, I learned just a while back about the mission continues. And so, you know, I was asked to mentor uh, a couple of veterans uh, for a project that they're, they're doing uh, uh, for the, what they call the v Veterans Transition Corps and uh, sort of boots the roots back to, to organic farming. Before we get into that one and telling what that's all about, I want to get to know you guys, okay? So, uh, Benjamin, you were in the U.S. Marine. There's, we're all Marines here. Semper Fi, right? Uh, so, Benjamin, uh, first of all, where, where were you born? Where did you come from? Um, Fort Grove, Oregon. Is where Grove? I, yeah, that's okay. where I kind of hail from. I went to high school there. Um, I didn't ever think that I would join the Marines. I went and saw what they had to offer, and I walked out with the papers that day. How um, old were you when you went? 18. 18, 18 years old, no. yeah. And I signed the papers September 4th, 2001, and a week later, September 11th wow. happened, and uh, I was kind of thrown into another world that there, there's a possibility that I would be going to Afghanistan. Iraq wasn't even on the map at the time, right. but uh, I had geared myself mentally to go to Afghanistan. Um, when I finally... What, what was your MOS? I was an AM tracker. I was the 1833 AAV crew chief by the time I got out. Uh, so amphibious assault, armored personnel mm -hmm. carriers that uh, l supported the infantry in their assaults. So um, you went to Afghanistan? No, I did not. I uh, per, uh, participated in the o OIF-1, the mm -hmm. invasion of Iraq. Um, I never thought I'd be there, but that's where I ended up. And, you know, amphibious tanks in the middle of the desert is kind of counterintuitive. But that's, uh, that's where we ended up. Um, I did one deployment to Iraq, the invasion, and then after that, I did two more deployments with the 31st Mew out of Okinawa. And then I got to see a lot of the Pacific. I never went back to Iraq. Kind of uh, feel bad for a lot of my brethren who did three, four deployments there. And I only did the one, but uh, the needs of the Marine Corps, I guess. So uh, I got out in 2006 off active duty. Uh, immediately started working with my parents and going to school. Okay. And that's kind of where... What did you, you major? I, I studied a lot of web design and media. Good. Uh, I actually uh, never completed college. I decided that I would leave and pursue my own interests because I realized that it was more of a... I don't know, uh, the, the debt bubble was getting big with student loans. And right. so uh, I realized that's the next big thing to bust. And I was going the private school route and the VA didn't totally cover it, so I was taking on a lot of debt. And I decided to step out of that and uh, become an entrepreneur myself. So. Good. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> Ryan, uh, you were, where were you born? Where would you come from? So I'm um, also from Forest Grove. Forest Grove, okay. Yeah, born and raised. Um, joined when I was 18. Uh, the propaganda machine was in full blast at that point, and I was totally convinced that I was uh, going to defend my country. Um, like any young 18-year-old, 19-year-old kid would, would believe. And I uh, uh, initially signed up to be a military police officer. Um, it took him about six months to get me that contract. Uh, then one day I walked in there and told him I wanted to be in infantry. Changed my contract, uh, then got signed up for that. I was a 0311. Um, my first two years in the Marine Corps, I was actually in... Uh, the Marine Corps Silent Drill Platoon. So I became part of the propaganda machine. And uh, we went all over the world and uh, all over the world and uh, participated in the America's Marines tour where uh, we filmed um, extensive commercials um, for part of the uh, recruitment effort um, to still do the, the march? Yeah, we, he still has an M1. <laughs> he has an M1 still. Rifles, uh, did a lot of uh, public public relations. Um, then uh, in 2007, I was uh, transferred to Camp Pendleton, California to 1-4. Uh, and uh, I went to Scout Sniper School, became No. 317, did a tour in Fallujah, Iraq um, in 2008 to 2009. Um, I actually extended my contract to go there um, and uh, made it through and uh, got to go on a nice seven month 
location on Uncle Sam. So <laughs> went there and I immediately, uh, within, within two months of returning home, I was out a civilian, uh, just thrown into the mix. What did you think of that? When you uh, well, I wasn't really able to think at the time. Uh, now looking back on it, it was a terrible transition. And it's, you know, I almost felt lucky because of the little time I did have to transition where many veterans, you know, aren't allowed time or resources to transition, uh, whether it be medical, um, career assistance, um, just overall transition help. Um, they do have a transition assistance program. Um, it's you know, it's a, it's a joke. Um, right. You go in there and they force you to attend these classes that are, you know, a couple hundred people and make you read this, Pamphlet. sit there all day, yeah, while they, you read a manual and that's your transition. And a month later, I was a civilian. Uh, luckily, the Marine Corps left me with a lot of uh, skills um, that you can't really learn. They're just developed through leadership and started a construction company, went to school. Um, earned my associate's degree and just kind of going with it. Good. Um, um, Either of you married? No. no. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. No. <laughs> Haven't bit that bullet yet. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, so let's, let's talk a little bit then. How did you get into this? Uh, uh, well, you said you're actually helping the mission. Uh, continues, right? Well, we work with, with the that, Mission Continues. Just explain to people what the Mission Continues is. From what I uh, understand from the Mission Continues is they are an organization. Oh, do you want me to hold this up? <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, the Mission Continues is a group that um, of fellows that they provide a six-month stipend to veterans interested in working in any nonprofit. It doesn't have to be military-related. Giving them, as long as the veteran works, I think, 20 hours a week, they will give them a stipend. And I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm not a part of, I haven't, didn't sign up, but there are four people in our organization that are a part of the mission con continues. So what they do is allow veterans to work on something that they feel is important to them. Mm -hmm. and, th and their focus is um, environmental, educational, or social issues mm -hmm. to kind of bring the veteran into the community no. to make a, a difference. Be, yeah, it's, it's, the, their name says it all, the mission continues. Mm -hmm. It's not, I think, that's a problem for a lot of vets coming out is they lose that sense of identity and they lose that sense of purpose and altruism that we all kind of are um, ingrained with in the military. And, and it's really about uh, continuing to serve um, the community and the nation and also um, about getting a hand up versus a handout because we don't want things for free. We want to make a difference. No. And, and one of the, the part of the mission continues is at the end of that six months they'll have a service project where they bring veterans, other veterans and civilian mm -hmm. community members together mm -hmm. on a service project mm -hmm. and then you know one of the three outcomes that they want you to get from the mission continues is either um, pursuit in higher education um, or uh, social project social project continued work um, or a full-time employment full-time employment oh. so. So the way the VTC or the Veterans Transition Corps works, at least that's what we're a part of, the Veterans Transition Corps, is, uh, well, first off, we're a nonprofit, nonpartisan, veteran-run organization that provides veterans with a set of comprehensive um, skills and resources that can be used later on. So we're, what we want to do is be able to take, combine the VTC with the Mission Continues, and anybody that comes into the Veterans Transition Corps we pair with the mission continues, they get a living stipend from the mission continues to work with us, essentially. And so uh, our first pilot program is called Boots to Roots, and it is um, vet helping veterans transition holistically through agriculture or horticulture, permaculture. Uh, so we'll go, the plan is to go to different plots, build those up, um, bring veterans in, have them get paid for what they're doing, and put them in a safe environment where they can feel um, comfortable and to basically decompress mm -hmm. from service. A, a lot of it is ab about veterans helping veterans versus mm -hmm. the system helping veterans. Yeah, breaking them out of the institution that created them, essentially. Because, you know, you go into the VA, and it's still the DOD, in a, in a nutshell. I mean, it's a civilian version of the DOD. And, and they necessarily aren't focused... I mean, their mission is, is veterans, but you know they don't have a, a, a real deep concern 
about a the individual, a almost, personal yeah. concern where, where a, veteran, a veteran can really relate to another veteran and, mm -hmm. and understand what he's going through mm -hmm. and, and be there for him yeah. um, without the, the bureaucratic nightmare. Well, when I first went into the VA uh, through my initial counseling, they basically put me through a series of doctors, talked to me about a variety of different things, screened me for all kinds of different things, and then at the end of the day, they basically handed me a checklist of the symptoms that I thought I had and the correlating pharmaceutical drugs that I would get. And so they basically gave me a, a, a wish list for drugs. And then they pay me off, essentially, with disability payments. I mean, that's the way they, that's their idea of mass um, transition for veterans, sedate them and pay them off. That's the way I personally look at it. That's a good, that's a good way of looking at it. And so... Not that they, they don't deserve the benefits, but... No, they, not at all. Not but, at all. I mean, then, you know, there's a lot of things. I'm, um, I'm just... We were talking earlier out there that oftentimes uh, they stop giving benefits to people because of uh, the e economy, you yeah. know, the idea that there's only so much money to go around. Yeah. But it used to be, if you're, if you're here in Portland, you have a great hospital up here mm -hmm. um, because we've got the, <clears throat> the OSHU there also, and there's a lot of combinations between people working. So you right. have a lot of, you have a teaching hospital, you have the veterans hospital. But if you're living in the rural areas, no, there's yeah. nothing there. No. People have to travel long distances no. to go somewhere. Several hours. Easily. And there are doctors right there. I mean, it would be nice that I, I would rather see a national health care program. So it wouldn't matter if you had a veteran's hospital. You could go wherever Wherever. You wanted you to. You could take that vet <laughs> card to any yeah, hospital yeah. and get the same service. That would be, that would be the great way to, to mm -hmm. do it. So that's just one way of looking at it. Um, but... Two, the, there's a concept, there's a philosophy that you have about going back to the earth. Mm -hmm. tell, tell me a little bit more about that. You know, why do you think that's a good therapy? And, um, what do you want to Well, it's been shown that uh, the agriculture therapy and the, the horticulture and, and permaculture, that it, it can really help veterans you know, with their uh, motor skills. Mm -hmm. um, also, the tactile touch of dirt also helps with TBI, it's been mm -hmm. shown. So uh, we, we're seeing uh, with the advent of IEDs and things like that, that a lot of veterans are coming back with brain injuries. Yes, yeah. And so yeah. getting them back into nature where it's a stress-free environment and they can work with their hands and be around safe, uh, in a safe area, um, mm -hmm. will help them with the with, uh, issues of TBI and PTSD as well. Mm -hmm. and, and not only that, it, it, it's going to give the, the veteran structure, which is, it's, just, it's needed when they leave a very structured in, environment mm -hmm. to an environment Chaos. that lacks structure. No. Uh, it, it really has nothing there that the veteran can hop into. Mm -hmm. So it's going to really ease that transition mm -hmm. and, and provide them that structure and that, that mission, mm -hmm. per se, no. of, of something to to identify with oh, a sense of duty giving them a sense of duty because it doesn't necessarily end when they're out you know i think veterans just lose all hope a lot of them lose a lot of hope when they just when they get out and they don't know what they are they're nobody again you know mm -hmm. i mean they, they they feel that sense of like you know i'm not with my unit i'm not a part of this large scale movement or military um and so it's being able to take them and say, yeah, we're still a group. We're still, you know, we're all veterans and we all have the same set of ideals. And mm -hmm. we want to work with other veterans to make a, a better community as a whole, not just for veterans, but for the world around us. Um, so it's about reestablishing ourselves in the communities, local communities, showing them that veterans aren't something to be scared of, um, showing that um, we are still an asset you know, and something that can be tapped into. Uh, because the things that we take out, yeah, we were, he was infantry, I was a combat MOS. I mean, a lot of that doesn't translate to real world jobs, but the, like you said, the leadership skills mm -hmm. and things like that, and the work ethic um, can be translated very easily. And, and just the sense of duty and responsibility is huge, especially in uh, people in our age bracket and peers, they don't have that same sense of, um, Morality, I suppose, and mm -hmm. so tapping that out of the veteran organiz er, out of veterans, and putting that, focusing that into something good is what we want to do. So, so how did you come up with the idea? Where, 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 where <laughs> well, did that all come from? We're, we're, we're not the first organization <laughs> yeah, to, right. to do this. We're, we're not. There no. was a, a the vet farm in in, Flor in Jacksonville, Florida. Adam Burke, yeah. Adam Burke. He was a Purple Heart recipient. He uh, he came back 
So you have a model that's yeah, it's a it's a great models, model, yeah. uh, and and they got a big blueberry farm down there, and and they have raised beds, so uh, veterans in in wheelchairs can also mm-hmm. be a part of the program. So that that's big, and yeah, and, it, big. and it really helps them down there. And and their model, they worked with. Uh, who did they work oh, with? They worked with the Work Vessels for Veterans. Work Vessels for Veterans. And we're also in contact with Work Vessels for Veterans. I, think, I believe they're out of Pennsylvania, but I'm not entirely sure on that one. But they, this Work Vessels for Veterans essentially provides veteran entrepreneurs with the assets they need. So you go through a, a screening process, and let's say you need a a van to transport what van a, tractors a, land capital exactly capital Anything assets like so we are actually uh, we're working with work vessels for veterans and they're going to be coming out next month or yeah sometime soon I believe it's next month to look at the different uh, properties that we have um, on on our radar essentially and uh, they will come to us and uh, if they approve everything they will buy the land for us and essentially donate to us for our um, efforts and, and I think one of the big challenges is you know we we're really working outside the veteran affairs where we would like to work more with the, the veterans affairs um, down in I think it was the Jacksonville farm uh, it was 75 percent more success yeah. uh, high, 75 percent uh, higher, higher success, success rate, rate than uh, the leading VA, VA program programs, which I think was at 25 percent so that's just that model goes to show that this will work, and we've gotten a lot of interest not only from other nonprofits but from the Oregon State University, the land grant university. They've been really interested in partnering with us, and if that goes through, then essentially um, we will have a legitimacy to use the G. Our veterans can use their GI Bill when they come to the Veterans Transition Corps to learn a set of comprehensive skills. So veterans can come, use their GI Bill, get paid to be in the Veterans Transition Corps, and then they can also be a fellow and the mission continues and have several forms of income while they work on transitioning back holistically. So that that is our ultimate goal, is to be able to provide veterans the opportunity to use their GI Bill with us and then also partner with the mission continues. Yeah, have you heard of uh, Nadia McCaffrey? I don't think so. She, uh, she had a son who, who was killed in the war, and. Um, she started a similar program and mm-hmm. actually had uh, uh, land and uh, stuff donated. I think it's in Georgia, but they set it up for organic farming, mm-hmm. and they had uh, therapists there. They had all kinds of different things to meet the vet so that they can come in and transition and to catch them before they end up on the streets mm-hmm. and go through this program. Mm-hmm. Another success story, you know, um, and she was trying to create these models across the country. Seems they're springing up yeah. across mm-hmm. the country. Yeah. Uh, We've been in contact with a group up in mm-hmm. Washington, and there's another group down in California mm-hmm. that are all trying to get the mm-hmm. same program off the mm-hmm. ground. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It, what, it, what about training people in their own backyard? Well, I mean, it's it's one of those things that we're working on, but we would like to be able to, like for me personally, I mm-hmm. can't donate my time for two weeks at a time just to go and uh, sit on a farm and work. So I want to be able to go there and learn a set of skills where I can take it back to my place and put up some raised beds and grow my own food for a while because, you know, food independence or, you know, food, if you have your own food and you grow your own food, then it's another form of independence. And not only that, back to the sense of service, you know, Coming back to a, an organic food supply, there you, go. you know that's that's a big issue because we got an agro-industrial complex that is controlling, you know, the way our food is grown in these deficient soils where the food is becoming nutritionally deficient and health problems occur because of that. Mm-hmm. And this organic model, local organic, because we're we're not teaching veterans to our plans not to have a commercial scale farm. Uh, it's going to be organic, small scale. Um, all over to cent- to localize the food supply versus centralize the food supply. Self sustaining because we have food coming hundreds of miles. You know, mm-hmm. your tomatoes are from right. from Mexico. Right. Your your lettuce is from down in Arizona. Um, it's really about national defense. Right. Because right now the the idea of national defense is you know three thousand miles away in Iraq or seven thousand miles away in Afghanistan or wherever it is, that's, that's the idea of national defense. But when Eisenhower created the interstate system, that is national defense. You know, our food security is national defense. 
because the world's population is continuing to grow. It's at 7 billion right now. It's projected to be 10 billion in about 20 years. You know, there's going to be some serious, serious food security issues with that. Mm -hmm. And not only that, there was about 48 million households that lived in a few food insecure environment, a food right. scarcity, where they weren't able to get either the right amount of food, the right amount of nutrition. Malnutrition is starting to rise in the yeah. United States, yeah. The, uh, one of the things that, you know, when I think about this is uh, we have an economic crisis, and uh, oftentimes we go to war based on the idea of uh, reaching out for these resources. For many of us, uh, oil or whatever the, the uh, the resource rare may be minerals. rare, rare minerals, uh, and when actually from a lot of the things that we we can grow our own food, we mm -hmm. have you know we were considered the breadbasket of the world for mm -hmm. years, and uh, when they start outsourcing these things or creating these large farms, we've taken away a lot of the skills from people, and their whole business is to export mm -hmm. rather than to deal locally. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we need to transport that stuff thousands of miles. We use up those fields again, mm. and there are hidden costs. I was um, reading uh, an economist, uh, I think it was Max, uh, I just can't think of his last name. He was a Chilean uh, economist who had worked with the poor people in Chile. And, um, you know, they said that they could buy uh, uh, milk from Australia cheaper than they could locally in their environment. Mm. And he says, but that's ridiculous because really, if you take it from the farm, it's less expensive. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that all these other costs are hidden through all these other different means. And really, if you looked at the real cost of that milk, it would be like $100 a glass, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because of the fuel that you wasted that was mm -hmm. subsidized, all of these things. And we wonder where our tax dollars are going or where our, our subsidies are going, when in fact we could do more locally uh, and there would be less reasons to go to war and less reasons to want those resources. Uh, and those resources are finite, and we need to be able to take care of ourselves. Yeah. You, we talked about natural disasters and uh, mm -hmm. to prepare. You're also working on a, a class. Uh, well, we've already, well, sorry to interrupt. Go, go yeah, ahead. We've already done one class at PCC. Um, we, we worked with the veterans group at PCC to put on a class for students there, that not just veterans, but anybody that mm -hmm. wanted to come mm -hmm. uh, on the basic on where to go, what to do, basic first aid, uh, resources that they could go download for free. Um, working with FEMA actually has a, a section of their website that is totally dedicated to a checklist. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just be, having that comprehensive knowledge of where to go when things go awry, essentially. And here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, we're you slated. under the table? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're slated for... A big earthquake. I, you know, I don't think a lot of people realize that. that so what, what we want to do is the Veterans Transition Corps is an umbrella mm -hmm. organization that has the Boots to Roots campaign for people that want to get into agriculture. But then we also want to branch out in disaster preparedness. Um, I've been. I have several good friends that actually are in um, Team Rubicon, which is an, a huge nonprofit um, of mostly medics, but veterans that are like the para paratroopers of Red Cross guys, you know, they just dive into the, the craziest situations to help. Uh, they, they were the first into Haiti, essentially, to help out down there. Um, so being able to take those people and tap into that knowledge as well. And, you know, if they have people that they, they can't find a place for, you know, send them our way. And then we'll, it's, it's all about... It really is all about veterans and helping other veterans out. You know, it's not about competing with other nonprofits or anything like that. Yeah, and then it's about those veterans helping the community, mm -hmm. helping right. the nation, and, and then going back into self servitude essentially. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's it's we're, we're looking at a variety of different things. We also do some self defense as well. You know, I don't. I think transitioning out of the military is more than just you know sitting on a farm or anything like that. It's about tapping into all your abilities and and it's like samurai culture like I was saying out earlier mm -hmm. it's uh, you know this, the Japanese had hundreds of years of peace and this uh, this samurai culture emerged that studied the arts mm -hmm. and studied health and medicine and um, Aikido and things like that so um, it, it's it's kind of the same mentality you know yeah. you, it's really about taking the, that, that military mindset that military skill set mm -hmm. and transitioning it into the civilian world because wow. they don't necessarily you can't go into the civilian world with thinking the way you do in the military you have to adapt that thinking and mm -hmm. change the way you think mm -hmm. and apply it 
properly. Mm -hmm. and, and veterans can be some of the most effective leaders and people. Yeah, exactly. Well, when I think of um, uh, samurai culture, I also think of, you know, they, they got into the art. Mm -hmm. uh, they did the tea ceremony. Mm -hmm. they, they read poetry. They wrote. Uh, oh. And a lot, of, a lot of transition for people is to be able to take what they have and find a talent uh, oh. or a different expression for themselves. And so uh, I think people need work. You know, I'm an artist, so I, uh, for me it's both therapy and, and social commentary. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, uh, some people play music. And oh. music is uh, healing all over the world. Yeah. It's a great, great instrument for people. Oh. Um, I actually, when I got out, um, I, I dove into writing right away. Oh, I, 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 I probably did um, 80,000 words on Iraq alone, um, just writing it all out. I never finished it, but I just I had to get it out some yeah. way or another. And there, there are groups, I think it's called Warrior Writers. Is right, I've met, met them before. Uh, they, they do the, a very similar project where they help veterans deal with their issues through writing. Mm -hmm. um, and that just all ties back into what we were saying with the samurai culture and uh, the warrior culture, essentially, right. you know. And the, and the therapy and, and, and like the holistic transition that we're trying to, to create because uh, suicides right. are a major issue oh, right. in, Huge. In, in, Huge. in the armed forces, uh, in veterans, veterans and right. active duty. Yeah. Right. Um, in, the, in the first 155 days of this year, there was 154 suicides. Okay. And the same time period last year, there was 132. That's an 18% increase year over year for the time period. And, and there's been more suicides, uh, soldier suicides, veteran suicides, you know. Than KIA. Than KIA. Mm -hmm. and, and 09, and, 10, right. and 11. Right. And it's not talked about at all. You know, the, the issues with veterans these days is never on well, mainstream media at all. I mean, they, nobody really knows the issues that face veterans when they get out. Uh, not only do they aren't given enough time to adapt to the new environment that they're going to be in, but the environment is very hostile almost. And they, they can't find jobs. Right. Uh, people don't understand them. People um, almost, they, they set us apart and set us aside as a, like a kind of a, a group that you know is on their own you know just leave the veterans alone sort of mm -hmm. thing absolutely mm -hmm. i mean i even you know witnessed a suicide in iraq mm -hmm. uh, you know down by the lakeside and you know it didn't really hit me um just because i was in war um you know that was one of one of two combat deaths that occurred on our base when, while i was there and you know that just goes to show that not only there's severe stress on the armed right. forces from a decade of war. That's right. Uh, you know, the longest war in American history. Uh, this is, it's almost insanity. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And 90% of the combat deaths in Iraq have happened after major combat um, was announced over. Right. Um, and then just recently, um, on the 13th of this month, um, we hit the 2,000th death in Afghanistan. So these wars are taking a toll, and that didn't, you talked about things in the newspaper. That was one right. thing that really didn't hit the newspaper. And right. Nobody really knows about. But when it was the 2000 death in Iraq, you know, there was 30 some news stories um, in, a, in a two week span, and it, it went on for weeks. But now you, you, they have to isolate the public with it because um, I don't well, know. That's, if it's, that's if it's one it. of the reasons I try to do a program like this is because you know there are alternative media's now mm -hmm. that people can outreach. Um, um, uh, online uh, uh, newspapers and magazines and blogs that can talk and, and reach out. But it's always hard to know where, you know, yeah. you begin to find something that's credible and, and you can trust. Mm -hmm. But I'm thank God that there's uh, that there is uh, alternatives out there that people can start to find yeah. this stuff out, if they're looking. Well, to, you uh, have to be able to look it, and know yeah, where to go. It, where to go. It, yeah, it's right. it's, essentially, it's an info war what we're right. in right now. The alternative media is is growing you know the right. legions are out there we're finding out we can get a voice out right and and the viewership for all the major um, uh, cable news corporate media is is, is dropping that's and right. it'll continue to drop and that's you that's know, why we see uh, legislation on the internet like legislation SOPA, on the, PIPA, right. ACTA, uh, international treaties no. that our country uh, may sign on whether the public knows about it or not is, is another story, but you know, defending the freedom of the internet, I, right. I think, is going to become one of the, right. the biggest things of, of our, our lifetime, uh, because sure. that is, you know, the human collective, mm -hmm. uh, the internet, and, and 
we're very lucky to be able to have that medium of communication uh, to find out and really act on a lot of issues because, you know, for the past for a decade, 50s to 90s, yeah, when communication <laughs> yeah. really, uh, since TV you know, yeah. and radio, yeah. you know, there's been nothing like the internet. And, and it's here, and we need to utilize it, and we need to really all use it to, to get informed and, and find right. out. Not distracted, because we are in the age of infinite distraction. Right. Hey, you're, we're in the possibility of um, actually uh, the grid going down, mm -hmm. and even the internet not being mm -hmm. available to you, yeah. you know? Yeah. So in your preparedness uh, uh, class, do you have alternatives of communication? I, yeah, we've talked about that several times. I mean, we saw it in Egypt um, right when the, the Arab Spring started to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, the internet was the first thing to go, you know? And in any sort of crises like that, communication... Um, whoever controls communication is in Ab charge. Absolutely. Uh, the, the communists, that was a big thing. They can control the communication. And uh, in, I think it was 96, there was a communications act that essentially uh, ordered uh, companies to put back doors in, in communication devices like your cell phones. So in, in the Internet itself, yeah. um, they could um, turn off the Internet. Mm -hmm. If well, they need, they did in Egypt, and and that was huge. They got people out on the streets. No, I, what I'm well, re reason that for is, uh, I mean, we've going back back it. to you know the old tube, uh, yeah. uh, uh, shortwave or mm, hand radio. Like hand radio. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine just was actually asking me about finding somebody. My, I have a. Um, a uh, uh, in-law who um, was really into it. Him and his uh, nephew, uh, they would they would go through <clears throat> doing that. They still do this, mm -hmm. but there's a handful of people that are doing that. But they can still communicate. Oh yeah, there's the there's world. ham networks um, all over the country, and there's actually specific groups mm -hmm. even around this area that um, are ready for any time of any type of contingency situation mm -hmm. um, they they're, do it with wildfires down in mm -hmm. California oh, yeah. if there's wildfires um, definitely that's part of the preparedness we have, yeah we have another veteran that we talk to um, that is a part of our group that has a, a radio network essentially set up um, from southern Oregon to Seattle essentially yeah, yeah. so and we've also have uh, documents on how to set up your own uh, local wireless network Networks mm -hmm. um, that tap straight into the backbone, and so of the internet that is. Um, so if the things were to go down, um, you can still. There are methods to go and communicate. I mean, it takes a little legwork, but you, you can do it. And, and back to the you know uh, emergency preparedness, disaster preparedness, um, disaster preparedness. You know that's key because um, there's a lot of things that can happen and a lot of things that can go bad. Um, take for instance the Fukushima in, in Japan. Mm -hmm. You know, totally unprepared for that. And the alternative media is leading the way with the information on that because the mainstream won't even speak of it. I mean, you have a reactor that's on the verge of melting down. It, radioactive water is pouring into the ocean. There's tuna fish that have come from Japan mm -hmm. to San Diego. They have found the same isotopes that are coming from that plant into these fish. And a it's barge already, just washed up on Oregon coast, coast yeah, right. last week or two weeks ago, something yeah. like that, from Fukushima. So yeah. it, it's, it gets worse than that because the United States nuclear infrastructure is at risk. There's been a lot right. of studies done. And, and, and they say just a simple $2 billion investment in, in these facilities will make them just incredibly safer. Because right now, if there was a disaster, either the, the grid going down um, from Earth solar flight. flares, because we're in a, the peak of a solar flare cycle, there's big risk with that, um, with the power grid also. Mm -hmm. the, the power grid is not um, where it should be. Um, you know, we're facing some serious infrastructure problems that can be enhanced greatly, the, the effect of a natural disaster because of the risk that we're at right now, especially in Oregon, with we have a lot of bridges, mm -hmm. and a lot of these bridges are in disrepair. Well, think about how many bridges your uh, tomato goes across coming, you know, to your local grocery store, mm -hmm. and think about how many tomatoes are on the shelf. Mm -hmm. There's just enough to where they run out, they get a new truckload. It's a it's a demand system. I plan on being a cannibal myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to watch out for you. Yeah. Yeah. We don't need any more. No. <laughs> You know, it's. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's grand that you guys are doing this. This is an incredible 
uh, service to the community. I think <clears throat> we also need to decentralize a lot of things so that people can act locally. You know, mm -hmm. uh, not everybody's connected to the big cities, and no, you, need, you need to be able to reach out to people. Uh, we talked about, you know, um, I know a lot of veterans. For me, I'm a city boy, so I, I can handle the city. Um, but the there's a lot of veterans that come back that cannot stand to be in traffic in uh, in the city, the noise around a lot of people, yeah. and they need yeah. to be out in the in at least a rural area in which they can be kind of removed from that, isolated yeah. from that, until they make that transition and, and decide where they're going to go with that. Yeah, cities are naturally stressful. Yeah. I mean, just for people that haven't been to yeah. that, they're stressful. <laughs> yeah. and traffic is stressful. I, I was actually walking down the street in Portland uh, a couple of weeks ago and. The TriMet bus came by and, and the air brake wow. shot off and there was a split second there where I didn't oh, know if okay. I was in Iraq or if I was in where Portland, the, Oregon. Yeah, the, and it was, it was scary for a second and then yeah. I kind of laughed and shrugged it off and was like, okay, yeah, I'm okay. I've been there. <laughs> so, and, 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 you know, there's, there's veterans that suffer a lot more than I do. Yeah. And, yeah. and I find myself, you know, grateful. Yeah. You know, to be in, in the condition to have my, all my fingers and all my legs. And, but it's it's important to get them out of that scenario so they don't do something irrational. Because, right. I mean, sometimes you never know what could happen in those sort of environments. I mean, I've had, I've had some issues walking into bars on a Friday night and then just n not feeling safe, not in the right. least. And I just, my first reaction was to get out, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's like... Uh, that that kind of spurs anti-social behavior that could easily downward spiral if you're not careful or if you don't have a support network. So, um, fortunately for me, I surrounded myself with a lot of other veterans, and they all, you know, could understand and relate and help me decompress that sort of feeling. How was it when you came home to your family? Did you get the same kind of support? I mean, it, I mean you well, seemed yeah. like you did. You know? Yeah, I, you know, it it was. <clears throat> Uh, I took a lot of it on myself. I didn't mm -hmm. ask for a lot of help when mm -hmm. I first got out. I think that's common for a lot of veterans, not to ask for help. Um, but I, I don't know. I, my family was supportive, but I, I more or less kept myself and internalized it for several years. And then I kind of had this, uh, this crash, I, I guess, where I just kind of all, like the whole institution that I believed in just kind of fell from underneath my feet mm. and then I then that's when I felt really alone and we did, we've done a survey on the VTC the Veterans Transition Corps where we find that the demographic that people need the most help is basically me is four to six years after they get out mm. an E4 to E5 um, that did a couple of tours you mm. know they it, it doesn't really set in until years later that right. what they had done, you know, and just like, or what they served, what they did in their service. So um, that's who we're t trying to reach out to. There's those people that, um, you know, they may have adapted earlier and quickly, but now kind of just fallen, you know, fallen on their hard times, essentially, mm -hmm. and reaching out and lending them a helping hand. Absolutely. And, it, it, you know, sometimes it depends on the level of uh, psychological conditioning they receive, right. you know, either going through, um, you know, basic training or boot camp or whatever. Um, I know as a Marine, we get uh, extra psychological <laughs> attention. So, uh, you know, the... You mean, break, you mean breakdown? Yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't stop after the yeah. workout. So. I mean, the, you know, they, they completely erase your identity and, right. you know, give you, issue you one. Um, so once that kind of, you're able to break through that, if you're able to, I mean, some mm. guys, uh, you know... Some guys can't let it go. Never, never yeah. do, yeah. yeah. They, they continue with that... Uh, that mentality that they were issued and they're not able to adjust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. I think, yeah, I think that's huge is being able to shed that identity in a, in a sense. Um, I think a lot of veterans associate that with themselves, associate with service so hard that they don't want to contemplate the, you know, what they did may have not been justified. Mm -hmm. You know, it took me a long time to realize that, you know, Iraq was an illegal war. And when I finally realized that, that, that hit hard. Uh, that hit the issue hard. I had was when I was in Iraq, I was reading a book called Fiasco, which was about the, uh, the administration of the war in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I got about halfway through the book and I had to put it down because I became disillusioned. I mean, I continued um, doing my job, right. but it just left, left me questioning my role um, and, and if, if I really was, you know, S well, this serving. Is, for me too. I mean, when I, I like you said, we joined around eighteen, nineteen years of age. You know, uh, what what do you know at that age? You yeah. think you, you know? Think you're, you're, you're legally <laughs> an adult. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's about uh, it. Yeah. But uh, you know, 
I believe, you know, I don't know that I believed in the war, but I, I believed that, you know, other people were going to war, and I didn't think I could just say no, you know, and so I went. That's what it became. It became yeah. me fighting <clears throat> for him. Yeah. You know, the guy yeah. next to you. Yeah. Because that's all it was. And that's what I learned the minute I got it, got to Vietnam. You know, the guys would say, forget about my apple pie and the flag and all that stuff. He says, somebody shoots at us, we shoot. Because we're trying to stay alive. Yeah. This is survival. This is reality. It's, there's no politics or game here. You know, it's the people that sent us here. And but then I noticed that part of my um, PTSD is uh, the betrayal. You know, yeah. you know that, like you said, you, what you thought just wasn't what was going on. And you start. I started educate myself like you did uh, to find out. Well, what? How, why did I come here? What, what was this about? Uh, still am, still yeah. still learning, you know. Still now I want to know about, you know, World War One, World War Two. I want to learn all of these things. And I just picked up this book. It's called uh, When the World Outlawed War. Have you heard of this? Mm -hmm. It's the. Um, uh, I never know if I'm pronouncing names right, but it's um, the Kellogg uh, Brienne Pack, and in uh, I think it was 1920s. 29 or right around there that they they actually came together they, over a long period of time people had been working on the idea of making right after world war one you know uh to make war illegal and uh they began to um, um it was uh, what fascinated me is that it was not by <clears throat> bipartisan is that it was a number of republicans and a few democrats here all working to say you know, we need to work on this and pushing these issues forward. But they were finding, you know, people just didn't want to get involved in the issue. The public started becoming involved, and they started pushing people. And people, they created treaties with France and Germany and a number of other countries came on. And it was finally passed. Uh, Coolidge uh, supported it. Uh, um, and then eventually, when it was signed, it was signed in under treaties. And the treaties become, uh, under the Constitution, law well, of the land, land. And they are still on the books. So every war since World War II has been illegal. Yeah. Uh, and they were trying to deal with, but they had all these different conversations and writers and various ideas. And part of it was uh, that people were trying to talk about whether it was aggressive war, a war of defense. And it came to the conclusion, you can make excuses, because everybody's going to say it's my country is a defense, oh, we're defending against something. So they were trying to, trying to come up with a, a, a view that they needed to create um, uh, a law that says, you know, that we're going to reduce the military. We're going to, it's almost Eisenhower's uh, uh, statement about the industrial complex, military industrial complex, mm -hmm. that if we reduce that, make uh, making a profit on war a crime, you're yeah. probably not going to have one. No. no. You know, uh, make a, a mercenary a crime. No. You're not going to create war. Uh, and if we as, as, as veterans can say and speak to people about things that, you know, that we would like to take our service to, to really provide for the community like what you're doing now. Mm -hmm. The fact is we do live in a world that has war. We do have people at war, and uh, they're coming back and they're injured. Um, um, uh, and they're trying to figure out why the heck they were there. They yeah. lost friends. Yeah. That's a trauma. Uh, it's a trauma to see somebody you may have killed. Um, you know, in this wars that are coming up, uh, some some are now they're sitting in uh, uh, in Nevada somewhere with uh, computers, yeah. you know, with drones, violating the sovereignty of other nations. Nations. Yeah. That's right. And you, but you don't have a connection. I don't know if you read no. Grossman's uh, uh, book yeah, on killing. On killing. Yeah. Yeah, on, on killing. Also. When you read that book and you realize that the whole idea has always been to try and distance is, the warrior from face-to-face -face contact with people. Yeah, yeah. Um, that this is where we're heading, and it it frightens me sometimes to think that a uh, few people in in so-called elected positions can make decisions for the rest of us in the, this country. Mm -hmm. Another um, aspect of this that was being put forward but never. Uh, uh, made it was that um, if you're going to go to war, there should be a referendum, and people that are forced to go should be the ones that say whether they're going to go. Absolutely, or not. I've heard that you know? many times. Yeah. One of the, one of the frightening things is is 
you know, the casualties are low. Okay, we got over 5,000 casualties, but compared to other other war, you know, that's pretty low. So people think that's an acceptable, right? You know, an acceptable number is these low casualties, but they're not understanding why the casualties are low. It's because the enhanced body armor and the enhanced armor on the vehicles and, and distancing the uh, the warrior from that, but they don't realize that. Well, the there's casual the ca a casualty is somebody right. that gets hurt, and these the enhanced body armor is really making the casualties well, the, worse because you know people are losing arms, people right. are losing legs, people are getting shot. Well, the wounds that were uh, may have been fa fatal yeah. in Vietnam are, aren't so fatal anymore right. with the way mm -hmm. the trauma teams are set up. So you know we might have five thousand dead from the wars, and everybody thinks that's acceptable for over ten years, but in reality we have tens of thousands that are. Burned from head to toe, right? Uh, maimed, injured. maimed completely, lost both arms, both legs. Um, that's brain damage, brain damage, B T I, yeah. Um, yeah, all kinds of stress. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, all coming back things. with a myriad of uh, issues, and now instead of having, you know, we uh, infrastructure set up to do, you know, it's we always fight the last war. It's kind of like the same right. way with the Veterans Administration. Right. We're still dealing with the last war. We're not we're not ready to deal with these new issues. Coming, and, or the VA isn't ready right. to deal with these issues. And in, in that book on killing, they talk about, you know, one of the biggest casualties was, was the, back then they call it shell shock. You right. know, during World War II, that was one of the, in, in World War One that was one of the biggest um, things they would pull people off the front line for. And, and I actually remember seeing that uh, uh, aspect of that from I was a I was a busboy at the Multnomah Athletics Club, you know, and and this guy they had this round table, men's round table, and these guys <clears throat> were all having breakfast, and this one guy sneezed, and this other guy ran all the way from one end of the table and punched him and knocked him on the ground, and they, people grab him and they pick him up, and, I, and I'm you know I don't know what's going on here, and I just asked somebody, he says. Uh, the guy was in war. That's shell shock. He you know, just the noise set him off like yeah. that. You know, oh. and the first you know uh, thing that ever hit me. I, I it's still there in my memory. You know, I don't. A lot of things aren't there. Yeah, <laughs> a lot of short term memory stuff is gone now. But uh, <clears throat> those, and those things people don't know too. There's a lot of things people can't remember. Mm -hmm. I know uh, Vietnam. There's a point in my um, while I was there that is just totally blank to me and mm -hmm. it's a part that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. and that part that I don't remember is the most frightening mm -hmm. to me yeah. you know that was part of my daily routine was yeah. erasing no. the past day's memories so yeah. I was there less yeah I remember blacking out the first time I shot somebody like yeah. I, my memory is just like a complete blank it's yeah. like trigger pull blank and I don't remember I, I really don't remember anything and like that's that. your your body trying to your brain trying to protect you you yeah. know and yeah. these are these are things that people don't realize and I'm um, there are people here in the in the in civilian life that have been through trauma too mm -hmm. but it's a uh, it's like it's just something you were thrown into you know mm -hmm. and you, you you don't know how to handle it when you come back and last year around people who care and, and been through it themselves and can begin to sort of mentor you through this process, yeah. I do think that people, veterans that are out there, if you, you know, you are looking for something as an alternative, they should look into the mission continues. So yeah. They should look into the veterans transition team mm -hmm. uh, and the work that you guys are doing. Yeah. Um, I'm sure they're going to run across it because the people that are in these programs are going to be producing things, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you also, uh, you have sort of business model training so that you can also talk about, I knew uh, Penny, who you worked with, Penny Dex, who came to me about this project, um, was also talking about reaching sort of people that produce things talking to organic farmers mm -hmm. and looking at markets in which they can uh, deliver that product and also make yeah. some money from that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, It'd be a small amount, but yes, yeah, yeah. We, there, that's another aspect that we've talked about is being able to provide veterans with the business aspect, right. you, know, you know, not everybody wants to be a farmer. So Absolutely. It's like, it being able to take whatever we produce to local markets and being able to sell that. And, and the, going back to the trauma part, now that, you know, a lot of the the culture in the military is changing a lot, so a lot more um, sexual assaults, sexual abuse is being brought up with the women. Um, you know, women are, women are in combat, just so That's everybody right. knows out right. there. Um, I, I worked with women, um, the lionesses that would um, search Iraqis as they came into their own cities, right. um, we would search them all. Um, um, alcoholism, domestic violence, the broken families, these are things that the military over a decade of war is really you know, these are the byproducts of that. And especially now that women are getting more respect in the military, 
um, they're able to you know report these and and it's getting more more visual, visible. Well, they're, visible. Fight, they're fighting it. Yeah. I, I've had people on the program talking about uh, uh, military sexual trauma, and uh, and if I was interesting too that, uh, that that happens to men also in the military, mm -hmm. and uh, these uh, uh, things that happen um, that there are a number of organizations, and it, you know what I'm finding is the veterans that are bringing these stories out. When I was in uh, Vietnam, I came back. I didn't have that kind of support group, um, and I think you know. Because I had a child with a congenital heart disease and stuff, all my attention was focused there. I wasn't thinking of myself. But when, after he passed away and stuff, then there's a lot of being in my head. Somebody was asking me the other day, how, do you, how come you're always doing all these different things? I says, because uh, it's scary to be alone in my head. I've got to keep busy, you know? No. Um, and Melissa says, nobody wants to go there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. It's, true. Uh, it's true. But, you know, I mean, I, I think there's, there's, that's a, sort of a positive thing about it, too. I mean, the positive thing is, is you want to give back. You yeah. have to stay busy. You want, you know, you can't stay be active. in your head. You have yeah. to be active. And you're constantly educating yourself so that you can speak to other people about these issues. Um, it's, I think, more and more civilians are starting who listen to vets. One of the things that I try to get civilians to do is don't judge, mm -hmm. uh, just listen to what they have to say, mm -hmm. you know? You can't, it, it, they may want to ask a lot of questions, but sometimes you just need to sit back and just let people say what they have to say and then walk away, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's so important. I also wanted just to remind people about this book. I didn't say who it was by. It was by David Swanson. Uh, <clears throat> he wrote another book uh, called the War is a Lie. I uh, wrote it before this. I heard him on an interview on KBU, and that's why I picked up the book and found it incredibly interesting. Um, I'm also, like I said, I'm with uh, Veterans for Peace on the national level. One of the reasons I'm really uh, uh, proud about this is that we also are dealing with Agent Orange issues and the idea that Monsanto and Dow and others created chemicals that poisoned veterans mm -hmm. and also poisoned a lot of farms uh, in agriculture. And here's an app.